I mean, oh, you got it. Okay, good. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everybody. All right, let's let's pray, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> dear, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you for waking us up and getting us through a long week. Father, I ask, Lord, that you forgive us of our sins and cleanse us in your precious blood. Lord, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> your beloved servant John said, I must decrease, he must increase. I pray that each person here, Lord Jesus, will decrease and allow you to increase in their life. And Father, I ask that you please move me out of the way and speak through me, Lord, and help us, Lord, to understand that we are in the very end of time and we ought not to be playing around, Lord. I pray that every child, every adult will get something from this message, Lord, and get on fire for you, Jesus. Lord, this message is so important for us, and I pray that you would help not only them, Lord, but also me, because it's a challenge, Lord, to be presenting this message and still trying to learn it all. So we ask for your help and we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us into more truth. And please help us, help us today, Lord, to put the puzzle pieces together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Does everybody have their Bible? All right. You got a pen or, or a pencil to write with? Okay, because we're going to spend a lot of time in the Word of God today. And you're blessed because you're here. Amen? And those that missed it, they missed it. But I pray for those on the internet, um, you're also blessed because you're able to see it too. Okay, um, we're going to look at um, three Bible promises. And um, is it possible to see my notes on this? I think so. Let me see. Now I click notes, so I think I might be able to see them when it comes up because yes. there's nothing there now. Yes, okay. Yes, you, you have the bread, the current slide, the next one, and the notes that you. you might yeah. Have. Okay. Good. All right, let's go to um, Psalm 46, verse 1. Some people praying for strength. This is a good one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Amen. Okay, and then let's go, let's go to Nahum 1, 7. Just give me a second here to find that. Okay. You're going to go this way to your right. Nahum is after Micah. Okay. Nahum 1.7. When you get there, say amen. I didn't hear everybody say amen. I had like one person <laughs> say amen. Okay. Let's read it together. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Amen. Okay, and let's um, next go to Jeremiah. So you got to go backwards. Jeremiah 31, 3. Amen. And when you get there, say Amen. Amen. 
Let's also read that one together. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with love and kindness have I drawn thee. Amen. There's one more. As I was praying, the Holy Spirit wanted me to read this one too. Wanted us to read this one. Okay, let's go to Psalm. Hold on, we can get to there. Psalm 34. And we're going to read verses 1 to 4. Okay, and we get there, say amen. Psalm 34. Let's read that together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Amen. I love those Bible promises. Okay, let's go. Um, I want you all to bear with me and pray with me. Um, because I did not have anything <laughs> pretty much all week. And I was praying and I said, Lord, what would you have me to share? And the only word that I heard on Wednesday night was famine. So I said, okay. I went to the first um, place that I thought of about a famine and I thought about Joseph. And I'm not going to go through his history here because that would take quite, a, quite some time. But I want us to look at um, Genesis 41, verse, um, we'll start in verse 27. And I want you to take your pencil and I want you to underline some key words here, okay? It says, and the seven thin, these are referring to the cattle, and ill-favored kind, that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind. So underline blasted with the east wind. Blasted with the east wind shall be seven years in, of famine. So underline famine. Okay? And then let's go down to verse 29. It says, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. So underline Egypt. Okay? And then in verse 30, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. Underline seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten. So underline the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. Okay? Everybody got that? Do I need to repeat anything? Okay, so in verse, which verse? Verse 30. Okay, I want you to underline seven years of famine. Okay, you got that? And then underline the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. Okay. Yeah, underline that too, yeah. Okay, the first verse was 27. I want you to underline blast it with the east wind. And then underline the word famine there in verse 27. Amen? Amen. Okay. Let's go to the next slide here. Okay. Some keys in Joseph's interpretation. We're going to look at um, this Sabbath. This is a rundown of what I'm going to cover. Some keys in Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. Our key words, will, we will focus on famine, wind, and Egypt. So you can take a look at that on the screen. Then we're going to look at how this applies to our time. And I'm going to liken that to the famine in the United States. And then our, we're going to look at our spiritual mandate, and then a call to action, and then we're going to close in prayer. Okay. Let's look at the first mention in the Bible of famine. Let's go to uh, Genesis 12, 10. Okay, and I'm going to read that in your hearing. Genesis 12, 10 says, 
And there was famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Famine is mentioned first here. Abram, later Abraham, we are told in the spirit of prophecy that Abram was sent to Egypt because it was the land that was closest to the land of promise. Okay? The next uh, chapter I want us to look at in verse is Genesis 26, 1. Genesis 26, 1. And there was famine in the land. Everybody there? A few more minutes. A few more seconds. <laughs> Genesis 26, 1. It says, And there was famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the land in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Amulek, king of the Philistines, into Gagar. Okay? We already covered um, Genesis 41. So let's look at now at Genesis 47. And I'm not going to read all those verses, but there's a few verses I wanted us to look at real quick. Genesis 47, 13 to 17. Correction, we're going to read all of that. Okay. Genesis 47, 13 says, And there was no bread, underlying, no bread in the land, in all the land. So we're in Genesis 47, verse 13. Underlying, no bread in all the land. For the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all of the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they brought and Joseph brought the money unto Pharaoh's, into Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed, underlying money failed, in verse 15, underlying money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for, for why should we die in thy presence for the money faileth? Underline again, money faileth. And Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give you for, I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the, and for the asses or donkeys. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So what happened here during the famine? Okay, but what were they doing? It starts with a B. They were bartering. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, the next um, time we look at famine is in Ruth. Let's look at Ruth 1.1 1, 1 real quick. And I, I, I said at the beginning, I'm going to start putting puzzle pieces together. And we're going to apply that to our time. So in the time of the judges, there was also a famine. We're going to read Ruth real quick. Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. I'm going too, going too far. Can somebody read Ruth 1.1? 1, 1? <laughs> There was famine in the land. Okay, let's go to Second um, Second Samuel. Oh, well, keep going. Ruth one one. Bethlehem, Judah. Mm -hmm. Moab. Amen. Okay. So in the time of the judges, during Ruth's time, there was famine. Let's go to uh, 2 Samuel 21, 1. Okay. I'm going to read that real quick. 2 Samuel 21, 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years. 
year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gideonites. So there was famine in the time of David. Okay, um, let's go over one book to 1 Kings 18.2. We're going to look at the instances of famine here. And these are, of course, not all the instances of famine. Okay. Uh, 1 King 18.2. Famine in the time of Elijah. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, for there was a sore famine in Samaria. Samaria. Okay. And then let's close out with 2 Kings 25. Okay, 2 Kings 25, verses 1 to 3. Okay, and my title in my Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem the third and final time. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his hosts, against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. And the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the, of the fourth month, the famine, there's that word again, underlying famine, prevailed in the city. So underlying famine prevailed in the city. And there was underlying no bread for the people of the land. Okay? So what is a famine? The, um, I forget what BDB stand for, and I forgot to type it. Okay, famine, hunger, famine in the land or nation of the Lord's word, figuratively. And then it also means dearth, famish, hunger. Okay, now we're going to look at wind. Okay, let's return to Genesis 41, 23 to 27. 23, let's look at verse 23 of Genesis 41. I don't think we didn't read that one. Okay, it says here, And behold, seven, ye seven ears withered, thin, and blasted, underline it again, blasted with the east wind. They sprung up after them. In verse 27, like I read earlier, we already did that one. So I want you to focus on east wind. Okay. All right. This is from the Hebrew wind, 20, uh, 69, 21. It says, eastern, east, eastern, the direction or orientation of the near east facing the sunrise. East is also the direction of the great desert. I believe that's the Sahara Desert. Thus, an east or desert wind is particularly hot. Okay, and that's from the Strong's Concordance. Okay, winds. What does winds represent in the Bible? Let's, let's look at, um, we'll look at a few of these. Let's go to Jeremiah 4, 11, and then 13, 11 through 13. I'm going to read that. It says, at that time shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan nor to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. Behold, he shall come up as clouds and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Okay, let's go over to Jeremiah 25, verses 31 and then 33. 31 to 33, okay. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, he will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. Underline, 
evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Verse 33, and the slain of the Lord shall be, this is at the second coming, shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Okay? So I'm not, we're not going to be able to get to the other two. It says strife, commotion, winds of war, scattering. So winds in the Bible represent strife, commotion, winds of war. So I want you to keep in mind winds of war. Examine, um, after we examine Jeremiah 4, 11 to 13, we learn that Jerusalem was falling to pieces and being destroyed. Jeremiah cried out, a call of repentance and reformation was enjoined. And then God scattered his people because of their disobedience. Let's look at Egypt. I'm not going to be able to get to all of these, okay? Because it's getting a little late. But um, Egypt is a representation of the world, sin, and bondage. Um, let's look at particularly Isaiah 19.2. Are you guys still with me? Okay, because it's coming. The good part is coming. Just hold on. Because y'all are on the edge of your seats, right? And I will set the Egyptians, remember the Egyptians represents the world, against the Egyptians. And they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city. So underline, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. Okay, let's look at Jeremiah 31, 1. So hold those pieces in your mind. Um, Jer uh, Isaiah 31, 1. Woe unto them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now let's go to Psalm 118, 8 and 9. Psalm 118, 8 and 9. It says, it is better to do what? Trust. To trust in the Lord than to what? put trust, to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put what? Confidence. confidence in princes. Don't trust in the world. Amen? Okay, let's go back to Ezekiel 27 to 8. I think we have a little extra time, so I'm going to throw these in. Ezekiel 27 to 8. Okay, it says here, And then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes. We were just told in the children's story not to look at stuff that's detestable. That's right. And defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. So underline, idols of Egypt. God is telling us do not defile ourselves with the idols of the world. I am the Lord your God, verse 8. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not. Every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Okay. Um, my apologies. I have to, I forget the verse for 1 John 4. Um, let's look briefly at um, Psalm 105. Psalm 105, verse 23. Psalm 105, verse 23. Okay, it says, Israel also came into Egypt 
and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And then Exodus 20, verse 2. Look at Exodus 20, verse 2. Okay. He says here, I am the Lord. It says here, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of what? Out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God brought us out of the world and out of the house of bondage. Amen. And then let's go to Matthew 2, uh, 13 to 20. This was a prophecy fulfilled. Okay. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Okay, it says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed unto Egypt. So who was the young child? So that's Jesus. And, 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 and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the, the, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Amen. And God is saying that to us today. We are his sons, his children. Out of Egypt, he's calling us out of the world. Amen. Okay. Going back to um, Genesis 41, 31. This came out of um, Treasury. Um, it's a book. I uh, can't remember. Scripture Treasury. It's a book about, um, it's a reference book. That's where I got this quote. It is well known that in Egypt there is scarcely any rain. So I want you to keep in mind, scarcely any rain. Now let's apply that to air, to here in Phoenix. How much rain do we get? The country depending, look at this, the country depending for its fertility upon the overflowing of the Nile and that the fertility, fertility is a portion, in portion to the duration and quality, quantity of the overflow, overflow of the Nile, that is, in order to saturate the land and prepare it for seed. Okay. She says here, the end is near. And I'll tell you the reference in just a minute. Stealing upon us stealthily imperceptibly, like the noiseless approach of a thief in the night. May the Lord grant that we shall no longer sleep as do others, but that we shall watch and be sober. The truth is soon to triumph gloriously, and all who now choose to be laborers together with God will triumph with it. This quote continues. The time is short. Keep that in mind. The night soon cometh when no man can work. Keep that part in mind. Let those who are rejoicing in the light of present truth now make haste to impart the truth to others. Keep that part in mind. The Lord is inquiring, whom shall I send? Those who wish to sacrifice for the truth's sake are now to respond. Here am I, send me. That's uh, taken out of Isaiah 6.8. Lone uh, church, no longer can we sit back and wait for someone else to teach us or to guide us into a deeper study of God's word. In my notes here, I'm, I'm writing out what the Lord had gave, gave me. No longer can, can we just come to church and go through the motion. Did we hear that a few weeks ago? Who was here? Adam Patel. We can't keep... Uh, gathering here week after week, meal after meal, then go home, work six days, eat, sleep, poop, rinse, repeat, all over and over and again. The signs are too clear, and I'm going to show you all the signs because the Lord laid this upon my heart. The signs are too clear to be ignored. This very nation is in strife, turmoil, turmoil and we have the truth in our hands, and we must press together and share it with the world. 
In, our, in the next few slides, we will make some, some more connections. So y'all gonna just bear with me a little bit longer, about 20 minutes more, and we're gonna make some more connections of some of the events, things happening right here in our part, in our part of the country. I pray we all wake up and fully realize our mandate. Let's look at a scripture real quick, and then I'm gonna show you um, a video that I have for you. Um, just give me one second here. You know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. That's on the next slide. Let me just keep going. All right, will this play? If I click on it, please say yes. <laughs> Will this play? It's about, it's roughly about seven minutes. I'm not going to be able to show the whole thing. Let me see if it play. Okay, well, I'll just sum I'll summarize it, okay. Um, so basically, what this video is gonna show us is um, we are dependent on the Colorado River. So 40 million people rely on the Colorado River alone in the Western United States. So the Colorado River is split between seven states. Everybody say seven states. California, Nevada, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, and part of Mexico. We are facing a coming mega drought. Over a million people do, do not have access to clean drinking water right here in Arizona, okay? And most of them are on the Navajo Reservation. For this reason, farmers, farmers are affected, and food is also gonna be affected. And I think it was last Sabbath, um, Elder David was, was speaking to me and another member here, and he was talking about how the United States is split in half. And half of the, the U.S. eastbound is green. It rains a lot there. 38.1 inches of rain covers the United States. We only get 9.2 inches a year. And then it says um, some things that they've done here in Phoenix is we um, have ways to recycle water, but that's not enough because that same water, and I remember we went um, up to Hoover Dam with Sister Kiosha, Makisha. We were on our church trip, and I remember we saw the, the water level was very low. We could see to the bottom of the, of the lake, and um, of the dam. And so I'm making a connection here. Farmers are gonna have issues. We're having, gonna have issues and because of the lack of water. So there's not going to be more water um, in this video that was discussed, and it's running out. And the political leaders are steering this use of water. So we have Los Angeles, Phoenix, um, Salt Lake City, um, Tucson, so that's four cities. I might be missing somebody. Did I say Phoenix? Four, that's four cities already that require this water. And I, I remember another member told me that um, the power went off, went out at, at their job. The power earlier this year went out at my apartment. So we need to be prepared. The grocery store, yeah, the grocery store went out. Now, I'm not going through all of this stuff to scare anybody. The Lord just wants us to watch and pray. Amen? Okay. Um, I'm sorry that that video didn't work. All right, here's another. Um, this was, what, two days ago. So it says, the nitrogen shortage to force U.S. farmers to scale back fertilizer. Farmers, farmers rely on those chemical fertilizers. That's the conventional way of farming. They don't do it organically, okay? There's other ways that we can farm. So the lady here um, that wrote this, Elizabeth Elkin, opens her article with these words. A shortage of nitrogen fertilizer is getting so bad that farmers won't be able to get what they need for their fields in the near future. And you know a lot of Americans re rely on that food, right? So CF Industry Holdings, um, the, the people that's over the nitrogen, that produces the nitrogen um, fertilizers, 
stated this, if the owner of the world's largest nitrogen facility is right and farmers have to scale back fertilizer applications, that could lower corn yields, and there's a lot of food products that are made out of corn, pushing up the price of food even further. Food inflation is already a concern with the United, United Nations gauge of global prices at a decade high. Comment, the, the farmers rely on, again, the, these fertilizers, but there's other methods that they could use, but they don't use those methods. So therefore, a shortage of food could cause food prices to increase, which we're already seeing. This could easily lead to rationing of food in the supermarkets. So what happened in the past could possibly happen again. Let's look, let's look at this one. Just what he said, history is repeating. So it says here, sacrificing for the common good, there was rationing in World War II. So let's think back a moment. During this time, the National Park Service states here in this article, during World War II, Americans were asked to make sacrifices in many ways. Rationing was not only one of those ways, but it was a, but it was a way Americans contributed to the war effort. Okay, when the United States declared war after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States government created a system of rationing, limiting the amount of certain goods that a person could purchase. So keep that in mind, because we're still putting the puzzle piece together. Supplies such as gasoline, butter, sugar, and canned milk were rationed because they needed to be diverted to the, to the war effort. War also disrupted trade limiting the availability of some goods okay keep that part in mind limiting the availability of some goods for example the chinese imperial army controlled the dutch east indies today's indonesia from march 1942 to september 1945 creating a shortage of rubber that affected american production and are we seeing limiting of products okay so yesterday case in point I was, I went down, I had some kids in my room for, they were getting some tutoring, doing some late work. I went downstairs and um, I said, I got to make copies for my next three classes. We had already got an email some weeks before and they were saying there was a uh, fire in China. Well, now keep in mind ink. So when I went in the door in the copy room and I said, oh, they sent you down here. I was talking to the copy guy, the repairman. And um, his name was, I think his name was Angelo. And uh, he had a bald head. And as I was getting ready to make my copies, I said, I understand we um, are running out of ink. He said, oh, you haven't heard? And I said, yeah, the office told me that China had a fire. He said, no, there was no fire in China. There was two fires in Japan. I said, oh, really? And he said, the two companies that provide all the ink for the United States had a fire. And we rely on that ink. So if you don't have any ink, what are you going to do? You can't make copies. And you can't publish books. OK? So they already told us we have four reams of ink left over. So if you go to Staples or something you need to get copies, just know that everybody's affected. If you got a copier, you don't have got that ink. Now, let's look at what a ration card looked like in the 1940s, OK? On what was that? Yeah. Mm. August August twenty eighth. It says here in the top right. It says on August twenty eighth, nineteen forty one, President Roosevelt's executive order eighty eight seventy five created the Office of Price Administration. The OPA's main responsibility was to place a ceiling on prices of most goods and to limit consumption by rationing, okay? So the one on the right, of course, is a gasoline ration car from 1942, okay? So keep that in mind. All right? Here's another picture. I'm going to give you some background on this. The OPA rationed automobiles, tires, gasoline, fuel oil, 
coal, firewood, nylon, silk, and shoes. Americans use their ration cards and stamps to take their meager share of household stamp staples, including meat, dairy, coffee, dried fruit, jams, jellies, lard, shortening, and oils. Now, we don't eat any of that stuff, right? Other than probably jam, okay? And it says, most Americans live off of some of these staples and many Americans still use coffee, dried fruits, meat, jelly, lard, shortening, and oils. Has anyone been to the gas station lately? What happened at a gas station? Four dollars a gallon. What else happened? Anything else? Yeah. Well, let me show you this. This is yesterday morning when I was going to work. On the right there it says, out of regular, unleaded, the, the Phoenix market is experiencing a temporary food, uh, fuel supply shortage. We apologize for the inconvenience. Then the mid-grade. Out of mid-grade, unleaded. I talked to another Adventist last night and she said, Oh, that's happening all over the valley. You didn't know that? And I was like, uh, I got a rude awakening Friday morning right before I got to the school. And it said the Phoenix market is, again, out of mid-grade. So I said, okay, Jesus. I put my card in to pay for the gas. I never put 91 in, ever. And thankfully I had, um, you know those fries points that you get when you shop at fries? It dropped it to 397. So here are two, these, are the, these, like I said, these were the two images, and I want you to remember the word famine. I want you to remember the word wind. I want you to remember the word Egypt. There's a famine that is happening right before our eyes, and we no longer can avoid it. So that's the message God wants, us, wants me to get out. We can't avoid this no more. You know, they tell us don't watch YouTube. No, don't dwell on YouTube, but you should be aware of what's going on. Watch and pray. Americans learned, as they did during the Great Depression, to do without. Sacrificing certain items during the war became the norm for most Americans. It was considered a common good for the war effort, and it affected every American household. So, uh, uh, I got a little fearful, and then I emailed the principal, and I showed the principal these same pictures, and I was like, I have to travel 60 miles round trip every day, 30 going, 30 going back to Phoenix. And I was like, apartments aren't going down. There's no cap on rent. Uh, the housing market is crazy. So I'm like, I got to get to work. And if this continues, I'm, I'm predicting we might be back to online school soon. So as we watch and pray, we must be asking the Holy Spirit to help us connect these events that we are witnessing all around us and be able to know what to do next. We have a spiritual mandate upon us to share the everlasting gospel, right? Amen, what's the everlasting gospel? And where's that? 14, six to 12, amen. And be able to know what to do next. We have a spiritual mandate, again, to share this word, the gospel. Where do our nation's laws originate? Anybody know where the nation's laws originate? Where do laws in the U United States originate? In Congress, okay. But before I get there, let's talk a little bit about hurricanes, okay? So remember I told you all to underline blasted by the east wind? Let me tell you a little bit about weather. Weather typically goes from west to east, okay? So keep east in mind. But a hurricane actually starts in the east and comes west, okay? So according to the almanac.com, it says weather, like I said before, starts, moves west to east, but a hurricane moves from east to west due to, due to the tropical trade winds that blow near the equator. Where hurricanes start. When a hurricane is still in the Caribbean, the tropical jet blows west, blows east to west, and the hurricane moves west to gain power. So listen to that part. 
moving west to gain power from the east. So what's happening now in Glasgow, Scotland? Anybody know? COP 26. COP 26 stands for the Conference of the Parties. The 26th meeting. The parties are those countries and leaders around the world that have agreed to the Paris Agreement. Article 4 of the Paris Agreement states, achieve the long-term temperature goal set to be well below 2 degrees Celsius. So that means around the globe they want the temperature to be stable and they don't want it to go above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. We initially, the United States initially was out of the Paris Agreement when Trump was in office, right? And now that Biden is in there, he came back into it, okay? So, again, Scotland is in the east, okay? Now, some key words I want you to hear in the Paris Agreement. Here's some more. Economic diversification, international support, avert, minimize, address loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change, okay? I want you to remember climate finance, scaled up financial resources, financial support to developing countries from developed countries, okay? What else has been going on? Anybody who's been watching the news? What else has been going on? Okay, y'all need to be aware. Mass walkout protests against vaccine mandates. So keep, like you put a puzzle together, keep those puzzle pieces together. I'm giving you all little pieces at a time. So this is one of the puzzle pieces, vaccine mandates. Another puzzle piece was a water shortage. Another puzzle piece, economic woes. Thousands of people across the United States took off from work on November 3rd to participate in walkouts and, de and demonstrations, okay? Just give me one second here. Um, I'm gonna read the rest of this article to you real quick. I want, to, I want you guys to hear the rest of this. It says, in Phoenix, the rest of this article states, this came from Epic, Epic News, it says, in Phoenix, Arizona, more than 200 people gathered in protests outside the Wesley Bolin Memorial Plaza. Many carried homemade signs and wore patriotic clothing in support of their message of medical freedom. What else was in the East? Where, what state you're from? There you go. That's at the top of this article. It says hundreds of Chicagoans protest the city's vaccine mandate at a rally outside of James R. Thompson Center in downtown Chicago on November 3rd. That was Wednesday. Okay, now, this is where the scripture comes in. Um, go to 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Bear with me just a little bit longer. We got about 10 minutes, about five, 10 minutes, and we're gonna be wrapping it up. But I want you all to realize that we are at the very end. Hold on. Chronicles 12, 32. First Chronicles, yes. Let me make sure I got it right. Yes, there we go. And it says, and the children of Issachar which were men that had understanding of the time. So understand, write down, underline, understanding of the times. To know, right, underline, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandment. So the application to us is we have to know what to do next, okay? And she says the church should be like a training school. We should come together and press together and plan. Our elder here, the head elder, has said in her writing, she says two or three families should come together and get property. Amen? 
Amen, y'all? Amen. We need to get out of the city. Amen? So what else is in the east? Who's been to Washington, D.C., Maryland? I lived there 28 years of my life. So your laws are made there. Okay, remember I said consider the word east wind? Okay, keep that in mind. Several countries, including the U.S., gets their advice from representatives at the COP26. At this session, and then they return to implement that advice here. And the way they implement it is through laws. Climate change advice is disseminated through the U.S. in the form of laws and regulations. Let's look at Isaiah 59, verse 14. Isaiah 59, 5, 9, verse 14. Okay. Okay. Isaiah 59, verse 14. It says here, amen? It says, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street. God's word and equity cannot enter what's this looks almost like the, the capital what's that that's the Vatican okay now I told you to start putting the puzzle pieces together all the puzzle pieces are not together yet so who's this Biden. President, Biden. President Biden when the president and his wife, Jill, arrived, this was just a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, the president stated, I want y'all to listen to this, he stated this, it's good to be back. They discussed COVID-19, the Pope and the president discussed COVID-19, pandemic, climate change, and poverty. The president praised the Pope for his advocacy to fight climate crisis and his advocacy and quote, in his advocacy to ensure, listen carefully, to ensure the pandemic ends for everyone through vaccine sharing and an equitable global economic recovery. So we are in an economic recovery. That's what this article said, okay? And you can see how that woman's mouth is open. That's how some of us can be, our mouths are open because we, we're in utter shock. This stuff is happening all around us. So the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. Okay, its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. Okay, and I believe that it there is referring to the United States. It is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. Now at the time of this writing, they were about to have a Sunday law in the late 1800s. We should endeavor to disarm prejudice, that means prejudice concerning who we are as Seventh-day Adventists, by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. So what is our mandate? And we're, going about, we're about to close. It says in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted, so focus on that word entrusted, the last warning for a perishing world. In them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They, Seventh Day Adventists, we are not to allow nothing else to absorb our attention. We are to watch and pray. In my notes here, we are to watch and pray, but we are also, we got to stick to our mandate. The puzzle piece is coming together. There you have it. I strongly believe the last puzzle piece, and I couldn't get that last part to work, this part right here, 
You need the, product, the false Protestant churches to come together. Once that peace comes together, they are going to ask, they said, what should we do with all these shortages in food? People probably are not keeping God's commandments. They're not keeping Sunday holy. And they're going to ask Congress to push for this national Sunday law. I believe that also another piece that we're waiting on is the stock market crash and the real estate bubble. And guess what happened last night? What happened? Two day, was it last night or the night before? The $1 trillion Biden budget was passed. So that was to avert what? The government shut down on December 8th. And remember he had tied in the, the shots? You got to get those shots by December 8th? All of that is tying together. So what are we supposed to be doing? Praying, fasting, studying the word, and I'm asking you all, please support. Support me. We need more people to give Bible studies here in this church. We need more people to pray, start prayer groups, because she says in her writings, we don't have the experience that we think we have. We don't have the Holy Spirit like we think we have. We need an experience that's going to carry us through the time of trouble. And we don't have it. And I said, when, when you're gut honest with God, I strongly believe if you cry out to God and you tell God what you've been struggling with, I'm telling you, he will give you that strength to get through this time that, that's coming upon us. So I pray all of us would press together. We have to press together. Pray more, fast more, study the word of God. Don't suppose that you know all, this, all these doctrines. Because she says when we get into tight spaces and we have to give a reason for our faith, some of us won't be able to give an answer. Because all this time we thought we knew it and you don't know it. I get on my students all the time in my classroom. And I said, I took the time to buy you a whole curriculum. The notes are there for you. I'm writing out the notes. I'm posting the notes for you. And you won't use your notes. God's people, we won't study. We won't fast. We won't pray. What's the problem? I'm agonizing with God. Please help us, Lord. Get out the worldliness, get out all of this stuff in our lives that we don't need. Because if it's coming. It's, it's right now. It's happening all around us. And I said, if we keep playing around, I believe we're going to be lost. We got to warn the world. That's our mandate, not the vaccine. The vaccine is not the mark of the beast, by the way. We got to warn the world. And I want you all. I'm inviting you to come down here. My appeal is, if there's anything in your life, get it on the altar now. Ask God to help you overcome it, okay? Because we don't need that baggage going into the time of trouble. We don't need that baggage going into the country. We need God to help us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Brother Aaron, we just received a membership in a 1,000 great controversies. Amen. So we're, we're, we're back in order. Uh, for yeah. those online. We just received another 1,000. I just unloaded them into our garage, so Amen. we're going to be back online with that with uh, National Sunday yeah. Laws and Great Controversy. And please pray for me because I know I'm, I'm, I'm just as worldly as I can be, and I need to get that worldliness out. Pray for me that I can be here on time, be here at 4 o'clock when we, when we were stamping books. We need to get back to that. The kids need to be involved, Pathfinders, all that stuff, because I'm like, Lord, this, her writings are happening right now. You know, help us. Help us to get, help us to um, be serious. Because, and then I just found a, t a nail in my tire, and I was like, Lord, how much is that tire going to cost? So I'm like, I'm, I'm like, Lord, please help us. That's all I've been praying all week long. Help, I, I, and that's all I could pray going, getting ready to go to work. I said, help, Lord. I mean, tears in my eyes, help me, Lord, because it's, it's coming down. And we need 
God to help us. So y'all can come up here and pray with me. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, you had a question. Oh, you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry if I missed. It. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, with this little feeble presentation that you gave me, Lord, I just thank you for this little bit. There's so much we need help, Lord. Please help us to be serious about our walk with you. Help my uh, sisters and brothers, help them Help the mothers, Lord. I have a, my, my sister with her kids and all my family members, all the, my church family, all the women here with small children, all the families that with, with kids and so much burdens, all the older people, Lord, I'm praying for everybody. Please help us, Lord, to get this wilderness out of our lives and help us to be serious about spreading the gospel and being a light in this world. We know, the, we know the night comes where nobody's going to be able to work. And, the, and we need your help to help us to learn these precious truths and share it through the medical missionary work. I'm praying for um, Denise and David. I see it all over, all, all, all over them, Lord. It's the stress, the strain. Just help us, Lord. That's my prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, I finished by I finished by 1.30. <clears throat> Woo. That I needed that. I needed that prayer. Amen. Woo. All right. If you need more time to pray, keep praying. Amen. Um, what's the closing hymn? 534. Okay, let's go to 534. <clears throat>